All right, finally we get around to Schopenhauer. I know my students have been waiting for this for quite a while, at least a couple weeks. Uh, I'm filming these videos during the COVID-19 crisis, and uh, so when I'm posting them on YouTube and leaving it up there so people, other people can see them, um, so who knows when you're watching this. But uh, anyway, so like I said, this is the first video for Schopenhauer uh, in my philosophy and the arts class, so we won't be focusing on Schopenhauer's philosophy as a whole. Uh, we'll be focusing primarily on his comments on art uh, and aesthetic experience and beautiful things, etc., uh, because that's the, the subject of our course. But this first, this first video actually will be more of an introduction to uh, Schopenhauer's general philosophy and uh, his idealism in, 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 uh, in the, his most famous work, The World as Will and Representation. So Arthur Schopenhauer claims that this proposition, the world is my idea, right? Tying, tying into the uh, uh, title somewhat with world being representation. But the world is my idea for Schopenhauer is the uh, uh, kind of the starting point uh, and, and the essential uh, axiom of all philosophy, right? This proposition, he says, it's like the axioms of Euclid, a proposition which everyone must recognize as true as soon as he understands it, although it is not a proposition everyone understands as soon as he hears it, right? So we may not really understand what it means or the, the full implications of what it means, but if we do, uh, we have to uh, recognize it as true, right? Um, it's only after men have spent their labor for thousands of years upon a mere philosophy of the object that they discovered among the many things that make the world so obscure and doubtful, the first and chiefest is this, that however immeasurable and massive it may be, its existence yet hangs by a single thread, and this is the actual consciousness in which it exists, okay? So, Schopenhauer thinks that philosophy has come to a turning point. Uh, modern philosophy has made this discovery, right? So for thousands of years, you had Greek philosophers, uh, uh, medieval philosophers, uh, uh, pursuing what he calls a philosophy of the object. And then eventually we arrive at someone like Descartes, uh, who tells us, well, this world that we're trying, this world of objects that we're trying to uh, understand philosophically and examine, uh, hangs on the basis of this this thin thread, the consciousness in which it exists. Right. Uh, so this is getting into um, what we would call, and he calls, uh, his idealism. Okay. So the world is my idea. This is the acknowledgement of this proposition and the elaboration of this proposition. Um, along with uh, what he calls the relation of the ideal and the real. We'll talk about this in a second, uh, of the world in the head to the world outside the head. These two uh, uh, are, are, uh, things are, are some of the distinctive features of modern philosophy. When he says modern, you know, for those of you who are just jumping in on this video, uh, we're talking about post-Copernican, right? So anything Descartes or after, you know, even maybe Francis Bacon, who's, you know, predates Descartes. Uh, we consider a modern philosopher in that sense. So for him, for Schopenhauer, modern philosophy's distinctive, one of its distinctive features uh, is this realization, right? That the world is my idea, is my consciousness um, by which I know the world. And so my consciousness is the basis of which the world exists, right? In fact, the world actually is my idea, says Schopenhauer. He sort of equates the two, right? We're going to get, we're going to elaborate on this uh, here in a second, okay? Um, but this picture here should be something that's somewhat familiar. We haven't seen this exact photo. I like this better than the ones I've been using previously, though. Uh, of the sort of represent, you know, this is a model of the uh, representational theory of the mind, technically, is, is sort of the, is one of the technical names we give for it. But um, this is basically an illustration of the problem that Schopenhauer is referring to here, right? We've got this world out here, right? We're assuming there's this object out here 
in my experience, right? Uh, I'm getting all these signals, right? These, all this sensory data is being uh, 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 presented to me, uh, and my mind is, is, is somehow um, taking it all in and processing it and understanding it as a tree, right? As, as an object out there, right? And, and the, uh, the distinctive problem, one of the big problems of modern philosophy is trying to bridge the gap, right? How do I know what this thing actually is out there? What is the thing in itself? I know how I'm experiencing it, but how do I know that my experience of the thing actually matches up to the actual thing, right? This, this problem goes back at least to Descartes, probably a lot further, but he gets a lot of credit uh, for really, really narrowing down on this, right? And his discourse on method and the meditations. Um, you know, and so you know, here he is again, uh, Descartes. We've seen him before, we've talked about him uh, before. He famously says, I think, therefore I am, right? That's one of his most famous quotes, cogito ergo sum. He said, you know, for Schopenhauer, uh, he's with Descartes on this, uh, this, this really, the cogito, the, the, the immediate certainty in the self, right? I can, I can doubt what's out there, right? <clears throat> if I look at an object far away, it might look different, obscure. If I look at it close by, it's obscure. Uh, if I look at it under a magnifying glass, right, I might see details that I wouldn't, right? What is the actual thing like, and how do I know that it represents that? That's all obscure. What isn't obscure is, is for Schopenhauer, for Descartes, is that I'm having an experience, right? Whether that object actually out there is anything like what I experience it to be, or whether there even is an object out there. For all I know, you know, like Descartes famously says, it can all be a dream. It could be a, an illusion of some evil genius. Um, but I, at least, even if it is an illusion, um, I'm not an illusion, I, I think, right, cogito. Uh, therefore, I must be, right? I must have existence. Uh, and, and then Schopenhauer, is, he's in agreement with Descartes on this. The way that he resolves this problem you're gonna see in a, in a moment is a, quite a bit different from Descartes. Uh, you know, how does he get to this object out there? Uh, you're going to see he, he maintains a pretty strict idealism. What that means, we're going to get to. Don't worry. Um, but this is the starting point, right? He, he agrees with Descartes on this. The, the self, the cogito, is the only right starting point of all philosophy. This foundation is essentially and inevitably this subjective individual consciousness. This alone remains immediate. It's something that is known directly. It isn't known through reflection. It isn't known through uh, investigation. This is something that is just directly known. All else is mediated and conditioned through it and is therefore dependent on it. This is a bit Kantian, actually. We just finished covering Kant. Remember, Kant thinks that we take our sensory perceptions, right? Whatever it is out there, Kant doesn't know. He's skeptical of this. I don't know. There is a thing itself. It must be assumed, says Kant, but I, I don't know what it is. All I know is my experience, and given my experience, I know there must be some category, some way that this sensory data is organized, because it, experience is relatively meaningful. Experience is relatively uh, ordered. At least it has some sort of sense of order or coherence, Kant argues. So that all these, these multiple infinite data of this world outside, of these flowing, uh, 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 Set all this sensory data is organized somehow, right? So there must be this filter, right, that we, we're hardwired with that's able to create, or uh, creates maybe too strong of a word, um, make possible a, a relevant, coherent experience, right? So this last part with Schopenhauer it is, is fairly Kantian, right? Um, the consciousness is known, we can't deny it, it's immediate, that's it's given to us. Uh, it's not known through mediation, uh, and all else is mediated and conditioned through our consciousness, conditioned through you know what Kant would call our categories or our concepts, uh, and is therefore dependent on our mind. All is dependent on our mind, right? So this 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 proposition, the world is my idea, you know, for Schopenhauer, that that this this gives it even more weight, right? Gives it even more strong foundation, makes it more axiomatic. Okay, so he mentions Barclay here. I don't think we mentioned him at all in this course. Um, he is also an empiricist like David Hume. 
who we have mentioned in this in this, uh, this philosophy course. Schopenhauer was a, 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 quite an admirer of Barclay's position uh, with regards to this problem, right? How do I bridge a gap between my experience of the world and the world out there, right? The world in the head uh, and the, the um, world outside the head, right? So Barclay's solution is quite, uh, what some people would say pretty extreme. Um, he, he offers a solution that people like Descartes would try to avoid. And, uh, but for Schopenhauer, he actually did, he did good. Barclay, he says, attained to idealism proper, right? So not only was Barclay an empiricist, so he, not only did Barclay believe that all knowledge is based on experience, right? On my sensory experience, my experience within my, my own sort of consciousness, uh, of my own emotions and feelings and my experience of things through through my, my five senses. Uh, you know, Descartes, sorry, Barclay was an empiricist in that regard, but he was also an idealist. Um, and, and, and what does this mean? We're going to get to this in, in a moment, but let me read the quote here from Schopenhauer. Uh, so Barclay attained idealism proper. And this is how he explains it, to the knowledge that the world which is extended in space, thus objective, material world in general, exists as such simply and solely in our idea. And that it is false and, it, and indeed absurd to attribute to it as such an existence apart from all idea and independent of the knowing subject. Okay. So this is Barclay's idealism. This is Schopenhauer's idealism. All these things that we consider to exist out there, outside the head, right? The objects out there. What is the thing itself? The philosopher asks. What is that thing out there? Barclay says, Schopenhauer says, there is no thing out there. This is it. This is it, right? This is the thing in itself. Your idea is the world. You are one end of this sort of pole. This is the other end of the pole. This is the subjective. This is the objective pole. There's no out there. It's all a part of consciousness. It's all the world is your idea, is my idea, is our idea, right? Is always attached. There is no object, there is no world without a subject, without a subjective consciousness, right? This, is, this seemed absurd for Descartes. He said this couldn't be the case. This would be uh, blasphemous and, 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 and it would mean that uh, uh, we couldn't know anything, right? But Barclay is completely satisfied with this answer. Schopenhauer as well, right? The world is my idea, right? Um, to be is to be perceived. That's what this Latin phrase at the bottom of the slide means. Et si is per te be. Uh, you know, for, for Bar Barclay, I suppose you could say this is what makes him an empiricist. To be is to be perceived. When I say that something exists, when I say that something has existence, for him, what, what, what that means for Barclay is that I perceive it. I perceive it in my consciousness. I, I either see it through my, my, my senses, see it, feel it, taste it, touch it, hear it, smell it, or I, I, I feel it through my emotions, right? This is a direct perception. So when I say something is, it means it's perceived by some subject, either myself or another subject, or for in Barclay's case, Bishop Barclay, it's seen by God. God sees all things, right? So they all have existence because they're seen by some consciousness somewhere, right? So this is, this is very, uh, what you might call extreme idealism, pure idealism, idealism proper, as Schopenhauer puts it. And he's gonna maintain it throughout his work. So he says, thus true philosophy must always be idealistic, for nothing is more certain than that no man ever came out of himself in order to identify himself directly with things which are different from him. But everything of which he has certain and therefore immediate knowledge lies within his own consciousness. Beyond this consciousness, therefore, there can be no immediate certainty. But the first principles of science must have such certainty. For the empirical standpoint of the sciences, it is quite right 
to assume the objective world as something absolutely given. So if we're doing empirical science, if we're doing observational science about, you know, uh, uh, you know whether water freezes at 32 below, you know, to testing what temperature water freezes at, um, it's fine to just sort of have this, you, you might call it, he would probably call it a naive sort of belief that, oh yeah, that, that thing's actually an objective thing out there. That's fine. Uh, so from the empirical standpoint of the sciences, it's quite right to assume the objective world is something absolutely just given, it's just there, but not so for the standpoint of philosophy, which has to go back to what is first and original. Only consciousness is immediately given, therefore the basis of philosophy is limited to facts of consciousness. In other words, it is essentially idealistic. So for Schopenhauer, the only philosophy, the only true philosophy is idealistic philosophy, i.e. idealism, right? The world as idea, the objective world, has thus, as it were, two poles. The simple knowing subject, that's one of the poles, right? The simple knowing subject without the forms of knowledge, the, or the forms of its knowledge, right? The, the, the knower without any content, and crude matter without form and quality, the content without any subject, right? The knower without any, the, the subject is the knower without any content, and the, the crude matter is the content without any knower, right? <clears throat> and both are completely unknowable. You can't know a pure subject, right? A pure subjectivity, a mind without any experience, a mind without any uh, sensory data, right? Without anything, right? What What is there there, right? <laughs> I don't know if that even made any sense, right? But what, what, what are we talking about? What is a mind by itself completely abstracted from all experience for Schopenhauer? That is unknowable and for Kant that's empty. And the matter itself without a subject, if you abstract from matter all the subjective conditions, um, that's really nothing knowable either because without form and quality, he thinks form and quality are things that the subject brings, right? That the, we, we have this sort of interaction, I, I, I suppose, with the subject and the object and the form and the quality that we see in the object, the shape of it, the color, that is something that is fitted to us, right? We get these inputs and we give the form and the quality, right? Uh, this might be something to, that's hard to um, believe, and maybe he's completely wrong about this, but let me try to help him out here. We all readily agree that color is something that is dependent on the subject, right? The color of an object out there is not in the object, right? It's, it's the, the way the light reflects off the object. And how I perceive the color might be different depending on who I am, what kind of, what kind of animal I am, if I'm a dog or a cat or a human, I might not see the same colors, or if I'm far away or closer, right? That's how astronomers um, measure typically how far away a star is or how far away a planet is. It's, it's the color because they know about the refraction of light and how light changes and color changes through time. So you know that, you know, we do know, and it's not too hard to swallow, that color is subjective. Color is completely in the subject, not out there. It's how, it's how the subject processes what's out there. So Schopenhauer is saying here that if you take away all those things like color, for instance, that are dependent on the subject, there's nothing left, right? Because he thinks for real that all of it depends on the subject, right? It's all subjective conditions. It's all dependent on the way that, you know, the subject mediates it, right? Through these concepts, right? Through like, to use Kant's term, the, the categories. Um, so let's, let's just go ahead and start over read the quote again. The world is idea, the objective world has thus, as it were, two poles. The simple knowing subject without the forms of knowledge and crude matter without form and quality. Both are completely unknowable. The subject, because it is that which knows. Matter, because without form and quality, it cannot be perceived. Yet both are fundamental conditions of all empirical perceptions, right? This is something I guess I, 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 I missed the first time I read, 
really what he's also saying about the subject, this is a, uh, he doesn't spend much time on it, which this is a pretty important and pertinent point. One reason we can't know the subject is how do you know the subject? The subject is the knower. You would have to literally be able to step outside of yourself is like a sort of the argument. Like how do you use the very thing you're studying to study itself? Uh, that is confusing. So maybe let me use an analogy or a metaphor. How do you take a picture of a camera with that very camera, right? A, a, a camera that this, this smartphone I'm using to film uh, this video with, it can take a picture of everything in the world, right? It can picture everything. The one thing it can't picture is itself. Uh, and that's that's the same thing is true of us. You're like, well, yeah, you take a picture of the camera, just take a picture in the mirror. That's not a picture of the camera. That's a picture of the reflection of the camera. A camera ta can't take a picture of itself. A human can't, uh, you know, a, a consciousness, a subject can't take a, uh, uh, can't experience itself because it's the one that's having the experience, right? It's not in the experience. And yet the subject and the object, even though they're unknowable, essentially, given these reasons, are these two correlates that together uh, make all per uh, empirical perception possible. They're the fundamental conditions for all empirical perceptions. Thus, the knowing subject, merely as such, which is the presupposition of all experience, stand, stands opposed as its pure counterpart part to the crude, formless, and utterly dead, in other words, willless matter, which is given in no experience, but which all experience presupposes. And here's where uh, Schopenhauer thinks he has somehow come up with this insight that no other philosopher before him has ever seen. Uh, Barclay got close, but he didn't really take it too far because he didn't really find the thing in itself. He, he located the thing in itself strictly to the subject, right? Uh, and kind of said the object, there's no object, but the object is a made up, it's not even a thing out there. The object is actually just your idea, right? It's just, it, all this is what's real. Perception is what's real, and all perceptions are in the mind, right? Perceptions are, what are what's real, that's his empiricism, but all perceiving is done in the mind, that's Barclay's idealism. But Schopenhauer thinks, no, you can't get rid of the objective, but you have to, what you have to do, you have to see these as these two poles. This is a hard objective pole, this is the sort of, uh, uh, the subjective pole, the knowing pole, and they go together, they both presuppose each other. Right? And, and together they make up the thing in itself. Right? So what is the thing in itself? You know, for Barclay, the thing in itself is the idea. Right? Um, for for um, Schopenhauer, it's both together. Right? So let's see how he um, sums this up here on page 451 from our textbook. The fundamental, er the fundamental error of all systems is the failure to understand this truth. Intelligence and matter are correlates. In other words, the one exists only for the other. Both stand and fall together. The one is only the reflex of the other. Indeed, they are really one and the same thing, regarded from two opposite points of view. And this one thing I am here anticipating is the manifestation of the will or the thing in itself, right? So for um, Schopenhauer, <clears throat> the thing in itself, right? This object that all philosophers have been searching for, right? I have my experience of the thing. There's the thing out there. What is the actual thing apart from my experience objectively as it is in itself, right? He says, Children, you idiots, it's not out there. You know, it's a part of this sort of relation between your ideas and your subjectivity, your objects and your, your, your notion or intuition of a subject, right? It, it's, a, it's a combination of the two, and that together is the, the, the in itself, i.e. will. He calls it the will, okay? So when I feel an urge or a desire or a drive or an impulse of, to do anything, to scratch myself, take a sip of water, to film a video on Schopenhauer, 
these things are a manifestation of my will. They're objective in the sense that I can see the video, I can post it on YouTube, but the will is the part that I, that, that's within me that I have immediate access to. We all have, Schopenhauer argue, immediate access to this will. And this will, he's gonna claim, is one and the same. It's this monolithic will. And all the things in the universe that we see before us, all these manifestations, he uses that word a lot, manifestations, right? Uh, there's this underlying impulse, will, this drive, and it makes itself into something real, something concrete, a manifestation. So flowers are a manifestation of the will. The plant has this will to grow. You have this will to watch this lecture, I hope. I, I hope you have enough will to get through the rest of the Schopenhauer videos and the ones after that. We're, we're moving on to Dewey uh, next. But um, for, for Schopenhauer, again, he thinks that this is his insight. There's this underlying energy or force that guides all phenomena in the universe. All things that happen um, are explained in terms of this underlying will, the, the, this, this, this power, this force that drives all life, all creation, and is somewhat uh, chaotic at points, right? There, there's order, there's disorder. It's not quite as rational and quite as, as, as friendly and nice as some of the um, world souls uh, that you might find in some of the like Neoplatonists and some of the early Christian theologians and you know people like uh, even uh, 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 people like the Marcus Aurelius and some of the Stoics, right? This notion of a of a rational, benevolent world soul. You know, for Schopenhauer, there is this coherence and order. We're gonna to get to this in a minute, maybe not in this video, but when we talk about art, because it is somehow relevant for art, but when we see uh, uh, order in nature, it is through struggle, it's through chaos, it's through a lot of tumult. Um, so these other philosophers that came before him, you know, he's not the first to think of uh, the universe in these sort of terms as, you know, the universe has a soul, the cosmos has a will, uh, and your, your own soul, your own will is part of it. This is very Eastern, by the way. If you're familiar with any Buddhism or Hinduism, some of this stuff might, might be sounding, whoa, what the heck? He was influenced by those philosophies, by Buddhists and, and especially Vedantic philosophy from India. So um, that, that there's definitely no, it's not a coincidence that he believes uh, uh, some of this stuff. But back to the point about a world soul, he's not like some of these previous philosophers who think that this, this will that guides the universe, that is the universe in a sense, um, is really just perfectly rational all the time. Sometimes there's a lot of chaos and tumult and these moments of rationale are hard won, right? These moments of coherence and balance are hard won, and that's why they're so important and, and, and maybe aesthetically pleasing. All of this ties into his theory of art, which we'll look at in more detail in the next video. I think this is a really good stopping point, just as a good introduction to Schopenhauer in general. In this next video, we'll dive right in and get really to the, the important, essential part for our class, and that's how does this apply to aesthetics? You know, how does this, uh, uh, apply this theory of art. So I'm looking forward to talking about that next. We'll move on.